But there was a problem here. You can sell prime debt. People would be willing to buy it. But can we sell subprime debt? Who would be willing to buy subprime debt? Hardly anyone. So there was an innovation here which enabled banks to sell even subprime debt. And this was securitization. You combine the prime and the subprime debt and then sell it in the markets. Divide it into small securities and sell it. If there was transparency about the, ex the proportion of prime debt in it and the proportion of subprime debt, it may not have caused as much problem. But this transparency did not exist. There was no right of recourse either, and so the banks went, kept on selling debt as much as possible, collateralized debt obligations as these are called. Collateralized debt obligations led to excessive expansion of credit. Credit default swaps was another way of giving protection to the issue to the issue of, of debt. And this credit toward default swap was a kind of insurance. If, you, if I have given debt, a loan to somebody, and I buy a credit default swap, I protect myself. There is uh, no harm in this, seeking this kind of protection. I think some of the fuqa have allowed a person to seek insurance for the, the debt he has, he has given. But then these credit default swaps became instruments of gambling. If I have a car and I buy insurance for the car, I am the only one who is protected. But you can imagine the, the problem when a large number of other people can buy insurance on my car. If there is an accident of my car, then I am not the only one who will have to be uh, protected by the insurance company, but a large number of other people. The risk becomes too large and the insurance company may not be able to uh, meet the, uh, the commitment that it is required to. The risk became excessive, and in, 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 a, in a period when there was boom and the defaults were very few, the, there was no problem. When, when there was a downturn and the defaults became more and more, then the system was unable to take care of these defaults. So this was the credit um, collateral debt obligations enabled the banks to expand, to sell the debt in the market, securitize it, and credit default swaps gave them protection. Rating agencies also did not do their, their job very well. They gave a high credit to many of these debt instruments, and uh, this, this was because of the vested interest of the rating agencies. The rating agencies were paid by the banks themselves, and therefore the rating agencies had a vested interest in giving a, a good uh, rating for these, the instruments which were issued by the banks. And then, of course, there is the very much maligned concept of too big to fail. If a, if a bank is big, then the central bank cannot allow it to, to fail because this will uh, dislocate the whole economic system. Then, of course, there was the moral failure. First of all, greed, the desire to earn as much money as possible through right or wrong means. And a great deal of fraud was involved in, the whole, in this whole business of selling collateralized debts. And lack of, there was lack of transparency there were teasing rates. Teasing rate is when you, when you want to sell a debt to somebody, you go to him and make the 
the whole uh, concept uh, very attractive for him. The rates of return are, are low in the beginning and uh, this uh, uh, system of flexible rates of return of rates of interest the in the beginning the rate may be very small and then later on it is it increases so the person gets attracted because of the low rate of interest in, and uh, then after a few installments the high rate of interest comes before him and he finds it very difficult uh, to make uh, to make his commitments so this lack of transparency, teasing rates, there was a great deal of fraud in this whole thing. Gambling, when gambling became introduced into it, in the collateralized debt obligations, as I already indicated, if the car is, uh, car, if I buy the, the insurance of my car, then the insurance company can meet the obligation when there is an accident. But if a hundred other people buy, the, buy insurance on my car, then it is difficult for them. So this, uh, this was, this was a, a fraud which was committed, gambling, and uh, the supervisors failed. Mr. Bernanke has very clearly stated that a number of unfair and deceptive lending practices were used. All right, if these unfair and deceptive practices were used, what was the central bank doing? Why didn't it come and try to stop it? This was because of the liberalism of the Enlightenment movement. Mr. Greenspan, the then chairman of the Federal Reserve System, believed in the Enlightenment and philosophy, and he did not want to put any checks on the market. So he, th he thought that the market will itself take care of the problem. But the market could not and did not take care of it. It led to this uh, uh, financial crisis which has disturbed the whole economy of the world. So Mr. Greenspan's philosophy of liberalism uh, had, a, had a, a great deal to, uh, to, uh, to to do with this crisis. Then there is this path depend, depend, dependence. When some banks start doing something, then the other banks also follow the route. And it becomes uh, very widespread. If something wrong that is going on in the market is prevented in the very beginning, then there is no problem. It will stop. But if you allow a wise to continue, then all other people feel that, well, this is very profitable, let us also do this. And uh, it, so the, this path dependence and self-reinforcing mechanisms enabled this system to, uh, to progress rapidly. So Mr. Vardanke knew these unfair and deceptive lending practices, but also Mr. Christopher Cox, Chairman of Securities and Exchange Commission, said that many laws were broken. If there were unfair and deceptive lending practices and many laws were broken, the central bank should have come and tried to stop it. But it was not done because of Mr. Greenspan's philosophy of liberalism. Now, the, the crisis became very severe and affected the entire world. Now, what are the prospects for the future? I mean, can we expect that in the future we will not have such a crisis? We probably will have it and it will be more severe than the present one. Why will it be more severe? Because on, uh, in the beginning of the crisis, the American banks had uh, free reserves of only $40 billion. But now they have free reserves of $400 billion, 10 times as much. And naturally, after the fear 
that has been created by the, this crisis is gone, the system becomes normalized, the lending will be more than it was in the past. There will be excessive lending. And this is all, what usually happens whenever there is a crisis, the central banks come into the picture and provide a lot of financing to the banks. The crisis is over, but all this financing that has been provided increases the reserves of banks and leads, leads to a more severe crisis in the future. And this process, process continues. Now, it doesn't mean that the central bank should not come to the relief of the banks in such a, such a situation. What I am trying to emphasize is that there is need for a better system, a system which will not create a, such a lead to such excessive lending. And here is where the Islamic financial system has a, has a very important role to play. It tries to reduce excessive lending and leverage, which excessive lending leads to asset price expansion. When the banks lend too much, the prices of assets go up to, uh, to a very high level. And then there is, there is a fear in the market that this may not last. So the prices start coming down. And uh, there is a st uh, this uh, short selling leads to a, s a steep fall. Short selling is when you do not have an asset, you can still sell it in the market. Within the Islamic framework, the, the, uh, the Prophet said, La tabi' ma la Do not sell what you do not have. But uh, within this speculative market, when the prices start going, going down, then everybody wants to sell. The short sell, something you do not have, you feel that after a while, when the price has gone down, you will my, my make an offsetting purchase transaction and uh, take the, uh, the profit. If you sold at 100, Without owning the asset that you had, and when the price becomes 95, you make an offsetting purchase transaction and you get a return of 5% on this transaction, it's of course minus the, the commission that you have to pay.